sports fans, I'm your host Quinn Lowe, and this is my stand-in co-host Nick Austin Holiday, and we're here with Between Clashes Sports. Big weekend, championship weekend in college basketball. Yes, A lot yes. of games to get scores on, get the uh, the follow-ups on. Everybody's still reeling from last night's NCAA Final Four championship game between UConn and Kentucky. The Huskies were hungry and they got it done. But before we get to that, we got to cover the NIT because they, while they weren't in the big dance, they still had some good games. First up were the, the men's. In the championship game, it was Minnesota representing the Big Ten over SMU representing the local American Athletic Conference, 65-63. to 63. I know you saw some of the game and caught the end of it. What was your thoughts on it, Nick? Ah, at the end of the game... You could just tell Minnesota wanted it more. I mean, SMU fought them down to the very end, but Minnesota hit some key shots, and they were able to come away with the win. What did you think about it? It, it was it was a good game. I, I caught a little bit more of the game, and just seeing how ho the Hollins twins, but not really twins because they're not related, played throughout the tournament. Austin Hollins had another good game, 19 points, 4 steals. But I think the, the biggest thing that kind of – I took from the game was the fact that SMU, even though they were snubbed from the the big dance after being ranked in the top 25 most of the season, they held tough throughout the, the tournament. A lot of times you have teams that if they don't get what they want, they kind of suck, end up in the first, getting put out in the first round. Kind of like what Kentucky did last year against uh, Robert Morris. But they fought hard and they had a point to prove with their head coach, uh, Larry Brown, coming from the NBA. So they did a good job and I think... The bulk of their players are coming back next year, so even with the departure of Louisville and Rutgers to other conferences, SMU definitely will be a player in the uh, AAC next year. Another team going over to the women's bracket, another AAC team was represented as Rutgers Scarlet Knight captured the title, handing uh, uh, UTEP a 56-54 victory. Uh, Tyler Scaife, one of the true, uh, one of the true focal points for Rutgers, scored the the, the the winning basket with two seconds left and, and, and gave them the victory. She ended up with 19 point, 18 points for the game. And actually, the game before in the the semifinals against USF, she took over. And we'll get further into that once we cover the USF sports. Um, but we got to get into the NCAA's the, the the March Madness, the coup de grace, the, the big dance. Uh, first game up, we got to cover because we're going to go through the whole the semifinals and the finals. First game up, UConn versus Florida. Being here in Florida, I'm not. I, I think you're a Florida State fan, aren't you? I definitely. So definitely. we were both sitting here, even though I picked Florida to make it to the Final Four, even in the championship game. Living in Tampa, being in the midst of Gator Country, did you want to see the Gators win? Not only did I not want to see the Gators win, but I wanted to see them lose in the worst way possible. And, and truthfully, looking at that 63-53 to 53 score, a point where I, I think this was the first game that they trailed in ha after half in a very long since the, the, the game that they lost to Florida. I mean, the game that they lost to UConn, which was their last loss on the season. Exactly. This was a, a game where UConn guards once again proved how dominating they were on both ends of the uh, court. You 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 saw Scotty Wilbekin, a guy that was, if I'm not mistaken, he was the SEC Player of the Year. He's had a couple of good games throughout the tournament. Was no factor. Two or nine, couldn't get anything going. Had a couple of turnovers, a couple of key turnovers, and it just seemed as if Shabazz Napier and Ryan Boltwright had them flustered the whole night. And it was just, in addition to those two, uh, Deand DeAndre Daniels, a 6'9 uh, junior from L.A., came in and put up 20 points on him. And this was not, uh, this isn't a guy that you really expect that type of output from, but he was able to dominate Patrick Young. Now, you've seen Patrick Young. This guy's a, a muscle marvel. So how did Specimen. And, and it, it was just interesting, even though he did end up having a good game and he gave, he contributed in a way to help the, uh, the Gators out, it just seemed as if, just as with Iowa State and Michigan State, they could never figure out the inside play. So what happened? What what did you think happened in that game that allowed UConn to take the victory that night? Well, what I think is I think a lot of people picked a lot of people picked Florida to win. 
on most people you talk to their brackets, everybody had Florida going and winning the championship. But everybody overlooked UConn. Yeah. I'll admit to that. I had UConn losing in the first round to St. Joseph. So for to see this run culminate last night with the championship, I will eat crow. I will praise to the, the Husky Dogs. And this is funny because I saw them play down here at USF and came away unimpressed. Even though they won, it, it just didn't seem as if they had the what it took. And I think that was the thing that left the biggest uh, – thing in my mind was like, okay, yeah, they barely beat a, a bad USF team. How are they going to get through this tournament when you see them potentially having to face a good St. Joseph team, face Iowa State or North Carolina? Then if they get to that point, facing a Michigan State team that everybody, including the President of the United States, picked to win the national championship. So it was just, this is one of those situations I figured, okay, yes, Napier and Bolt Wright were great players at the back. Uh, in the backcourt, but did they have enough elsewhere? And obviously, Kevin Ollie proved to be a great coach, and he proved to have the weapons. Now, we got to get to this Kentucky-Wisconsin game. Kentucky ended up winning 74-73. What happened in the game? Well, Kentucky, Kentucky tried to come out, Kentucky tried to come out and prove a point, because everybody started, I mean, everybody said Kentucky had the length down low, right. but everybody was Everybody was down in Kentucky on this big stage because of how young their players were. Right. Uh, they came out, but as unathletic as Wisconsin's team was, Wisconsin came, Wisconsin shot the lights out. Right. And that's how they were able to stay in the game. They, they, they took it all the way to the end, but in the end, Kentucky, Wisconsin didn't have a player. Wisconsin had maybe one player, maybe two, that could take somebody off the dribble. Right. Kentucky has an entire team that can do that. Right, including it's, Julius Randle. So it, it was, it's just one of those things. And I realized, and, and it came to bite them in the, in the championship ga game last night, free throws. This is the easiest shot in basketball. And we saw uh, Trayvon Jackson, the son of Jim Jackson, former NBA star, Ohio State Buckeye alum, missed a critical free throw. Got foul shooting a three-pointer. Not much time left. If he hits all three free throws, at worst, the best thing that Kentucky could do was tie the game. He misses the first free throw, leaves the door open, and I can remember, I can recall, with 16 seconds left, before he even shot the free throws, I was a lot of the people on Twitter that I follow were saying, oh, this game is over, Wisconsin's going to win, Kentucky can't fight back. And I told them there's too much time left in this game. And sure enough, the free throw left the door open, and and they were able to. Aaron Harris hit another key three pointer, and I'm the fan that's more upset about this because of what he did to my Michigan Wolverines. <laughs> and it was an improbable shot, but unlike what Michigan couldn't do, Wisconsin was able to force their issue. They had enough weapons. What there was. Uh, Frank the Tank Kaminsky that was able to score inside and outside. Decker was able to give them some points. And even though Trayvon missed that free throw, he had a very good game. He just, you just choked at the wrong opportunity. And he opened the door. And I think after that game, a lot of people began to believe maybe this is Kentucky's year. Now going into, before, after those two games, who did you have going to cut the nets down between UConn and Kentucky? And why? Well, Kentucky tried to make me a believer too. <laughs> they 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 tried to make me a believer. I after the after the Wisconsin game, I was I was just like, wow. Kentucky keeps finding a way to pull it out at the very end. But I still gave UConn the advantage. I I, just, I gave them a slight advantage because of experience. Right. And if you if you get two talented teams, experience typically wins yeah. out. Yep. And, and, and case in point was the fact that Shabazz Napier, as a freshman, was on that UConn 2011 championship team. And to have your lead guard have four years of being able to say of that, that, that high pressure, even though they did miss the NCAA tournament last year, and he made a point of telling everybody in the NCAAs where, he, where they could shove that band last night in the celebration, 
but it taught them something and it kept them hungry and it put them in a position where they they knew going into this season with a new coach that was being thoroughly disrespected by the university this guy was essentially a temp job this was a temp job for Kevin Ollie. He they didn't want to give him a contract extension they weren't sure if he was going to be the guy to follow Jim Calhoun and he's proven them I know what I'm doing I might not because he didn't have the best talent, but he was the best coach. And go ahead. Ali is about to get paid. Definitely. Uh, Ali's about to get Ali's about to get a nice contract from this game. And, but this shows this this game that game shows that when your players believe in the coach, right, anything is possible. When your players buy a hundred percent into the program and the coach, things like that happen. And, and then you have to look at the coaches that he beat along the way. Fred Hoiberg from Iowa State, who's one of the up-and-coming great coaches. Tom Izzo, who's a top-five coach. Billy Donovan, who some argue, even outside of the Florida circles, as being one of the best coaches in college basketball. Um, then he beats Coach Cal. This is a... I've never seen a coach have to go through this gauntlet. Everybody talked about that, that bracket of death in the Midwest. But look at what Kevin Ollie was able to do to get this championship. This is not a situation where you can say, oh, the players did it. Because you were going up against some of the best of the best in that bracket. And he showed, I know when to call the right time out. I know when to, to pull the, the, to bring in the subs. He had, he made all the right moves. He knew when to calm the team down. And it, it worked. And it, it, it was just a testament to show what can be done when you get a chance. Because everybody was making, I think it's the last... African American coach to win the national championship was Toby Smith at Kentucky. I believe you're right. And you saw what happened with Kentucky, how they ran him out of town. There's, I'm not sure how true this is. There's been some preliminary talks about Coach Cal going to LA. Don't buy it because the NBA is not for those guys that have too much control. He had, he likes having control over his players. But also, there was some conversation going where he may step away from this, from that team because at Kentucky, you can't ever satisfy that Wildcat Nation. Look at it. Tubby Smith got ran out. Patino got ran out. And these are coaches that did well and won championships. So what, what do you say for a, a coach that has only won one championship and been to the Final Four a couple of years and has an air of some issues there? Is he going to stay? Is he going to go? Well... Calipari, Calipari is the type of coach that goes into a program and he can, he'll ruffle a lot of feathers. Definitely. Like, he'll, he'll, he'll upset boosters. I, you know, he may even upset fans. Calipari has completely bought into the one-and-done player. Right. So he, that's how he recruits. He recruits players. He brings them in to play only one year and then go to the NBA. Right. The reason why he won't make us – the reason why I don't think he'll make us – a successful coach in the NBA is that's, that's player development over years. Definitely, that's that's not that's not his thing. Yes, I mean sometimes his players buy into the system, like when they won the championship, you know, a couple years ago. Yeah, because Terrence Jones, he had a couple of upperclassmen on that team that were yeah. significant contributors. Yeah, he always has, and I think they had to remove a clause in his contract for every. He got a he was he used to get a bonus for every senior that he graduated, but it wasn't really a. a legitimate clause, he would just put a walk on on his team that was a senior so he could keep getting the clause. Whereas they realized the, the best players that he was bringing in as, as recruits weren't graduating. So they removed the clause. So going back to what you were saying about player development, that's definitely a situation. In addition to the fact that you're dealing with NBA contracts now, you know Cal knows, well with him is one every year he's turning over that roster. So it's exactly. easy for him to say, I can deal with this malcontent. Or this bad this head case because I know one or two years at most he's out of the program. What is he gonna do with someone like Swaggy P that's signed a four or five year contract and he can't trade because of the contract is so high? That's where the issue is gonna come into, and it's, it, it, it'll be interesting to see how things go. But we're up against the break, and when we come back, we'll we'll discuss what's been going on locally in the Tampa area. We'll see you in a few. Uh, hello, my name is Toby Scott. And hello, my name is Enrico Chow. And I'd like to congratulate all the new businesses out there. And from Chow Scott Kesey.
What we provide in the Tampa Bay community is we provide headshots, banners, business cards, and postcards. And on our link on our website link, you can also click the one that best fits you. And we would like to hear from you soon. Congratulations. Welcome back, sports fans. Once again, I'm Quinn Lowe, and this is my stand-in co-host, Nick Austin Holiday. And this week's Tampa Recaps is brought to you by Clear Video Internet Broadcasting. Guess what we're going to start first is the spring game for USF. Coming off of a 2-10 season, USF football has had to find something good to build upon. And after being at the spring game a couple of weeks ago, it looks like the team is finally going in the right direction. When you thought about USF last year, what was the first word that came to mind? Horrible. <laughs> See, now fans, I wasn't this bad. For those who've listened to the show, I, I haven't been this bad, but I can't blame him for feeling this way. This is a fan of sports. This is a football fan, and he saw from a different perspective because I've kind of jumped to the media side. This is a true fan standing here right now. And he understands how hard it is, how hard it was to follow USF and to to coin the, the term used by the head coach, the bus was broken down. But it looks like after the spring game, Coach Tagger has finally got some of the right pieces on the bus again. Um, first up is the quarterback position. They say if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have one. But in this case, I think it may be best that USF has two quarterbacks so they can find who the best who's best suited for the program. Coming stepping up first, Stephen Bench, I think he was a transfer from Penn State, ended up with 317 yards, three touchdowns. Even though the, the stats really don't matter, he showed a level of of competitiveness that was lacking from the program last year. It seemed as if the quarterback position couldn't complete five yards. I mean you couldn't complete a five yard pass or a necessary first down. And you being a Florida State fan, I know Having the Heisman Trophy winner, how important is it to have good quarterback play? Having good quarterback play drives your team. You can you can build a strong team around a somewhat I don't want to say a mediocre quarterback, but just a quarterback that's above average. I think Alabama is a perfect example of when you build a team around a, a above average quarterback, but not a great quarterback. Right. To use the the, the ever famous word. A game manager. That's the, the that's the epitome of every Alabama quarterback. Even A.J. McCarron, who some people have kind of bumped up this year and said he might be even a second or third round pick. I'm not buying it, but whatever, whatever. This isn't the Alabama show. Get back to Florida. I'm glad you brought up that the fact that if you have a, a decent quarterback, you can play well because looking at so many of the USF games last year, from the Michigan State game to even – the UCF game, they had they were in positions where the defense held up. They just got tired from holding the fort. You can only do so much defensively before the other team keeps running players in and out and you have to stay on the field for 5, 10, 15 minute drives or drives that are continual 2 and 3 minute drives because your offense can't move the ball. And it's, it, it, it's interest, it will be interesting to see how things kind of turn around this year. One key piece to the program this year that's going into a senior uh, season, local prospect Andre Davis. Had a good spring game. This is his opportunity to be a breakout year, have another breakout year, and potentially get some looks for the NFL. I know, once again, I'm going to refer to you because Florida State had a, a bevy of wide receivers last year, Kelvin Benjamin being the headliner. How important is it that Andre Davis find some continuity with his with his quarterback? Because I think that's the one thing that has helped that has hurt him a lot in the in most of the games last year. He didn't have anybody throwing to him, and he still had a decent game. I think I think a perfect example to I think a perfect way to explain that is look at EJ Manuel when he was the quarterback at Florida State. EJ Manuel had the same wide receivers that Jameis Winston had this past year, right. but. EJ Manuel didn't have the same type of chemistry with the receivers. When when the quarter when the quarterback and the receivers are on the same page, you get a national championship championship season like you got with Florida State. And you get three rings. I know you showed us the picture of the three rings. This, I mean, I guess they they all these college athletes cry about not having the money. But if you have Florida State and you got those three rings, 
you can eat for a nice period of time if you decide and you ever get to the point where you got to pawn those rings. But we're not going to talk about this on this show because I already feel some kind of way. I mean, even Shabazz Napier last night conveniently dropped the interview where he was talking about he, he doesn't have anything to eat after 7 p.m. For real. You're a college basketball star. And this isn't even talking about the, the school going on a quick tangent. As a star athlete, you telling me there's no groupie on campus that's willing to cook dinner for you? You should be able to have instant, you should just meet, be able to make a phone call and say, I'm hungry, I need something. And girls should be willing to bring you food. Not to mention the, the, the coach's mom, the coach's wife can conveniently cook, oh, let's have players dinner. And just feed these players. This isn't a matter of doing anything illegal. So for him to say, oh, we're starving, that means you're not doing something right. Exactly. But that's neither here nor there. And I know I kind of made some people upset with that comment, but I'm a sports fan. This is my, this, you've seen, if you've seen the show, you know we don't pull punches. So you got to live with it. Going, to, going next, back to basketball, women's NIT. USF ended their season kind of on a sour note. They fell to the eventual champion with Rutgers. But I think the hardest part of that game was seeing senior Inga Orkova struggle so bad. She ended up 3 of 18 with, I think she might have, she took 11 three pointers, only hit two. Now, I'm not a, I didn't play basketball on a high level. Did you play sports? It's like, how frustrating is it when you see whether you play football, whether you play basketball, baseball, where everything you do isn't going right. So it's like, for you to be a senior and having to deal with that, how I know you have to empathize with that. How hard is that for a player? I think, the mark, I think one of the marks of a good player is, or even a great player, is sometimes you have to realize it's not your night. Right. You can't, you can't take 11 threes and only hit two. You have to you have to defer to your teammates when you realize that things aren't going your way. That's that's the way you propel your team to greatness and to win games. Right. And I think there were a couple of shots because even in the second half, because I, I don't think she hit a three pointer the first half. She hit one, and the crowd fought, got that mindset of that thinking that maybe this is the opportunity. Then she missed the next two or three, and it kind of killed the momentum. And it, it took away from what Courtney Williams, the sophomore, was doing because she ended up with 19 points and 7 rebounds. And I guess the good thing about USF going forward is, even though they were snubbed from the NCAAs this year, and both Jose Fernandez, the coach, and C. Vivian, C. Vivian Stringer, the, the Rutgers coach, admitted both programs should have made the NCAAs, you have a USF program that are only losing two seniors. So they have a, a bevy of talent including the two of the three best players on their pro, uh, on their team, Courtney Williams and uh, Alicia uh, Jenkins, who are coming back. So that's a good foundation piece right there for the program. It's just about figuring out in this offseason how hungry these players are and what are they willing to do to get to that next level. Um, one more, a couple more things in uh, USF. We got to get to the non the, the non revenue generating sports, the sports that get canceled because football and basketball take all the money and, and are a little bit greedy. They call them now. They have a new term for it. They call it the Olympic sports. We got USF tennis has been doing pretty well. They finished the season ten and zero at home, fifteen and three overall, and they're getting ready now for the conference, the inaugural American Athletic Conference uh, championship on April seventeenth. So, kudos to the young women that are on the team. Good luck. Also, we have history in the making. Um, the USF men's track and field team broke the 4x100 uh, school record with a time of 40.34 40 uh, 40 seconds. Led by Derek Hopkins, Sharif Lewis, Day Young Yoon, and Alfred Higgs. This was one... Being in Florida, this is, whether it's football or track, These, this is speed. Speed kills. And, and just looking at the, the location, of Opelika, Hollywood, even the Bahamas, these guys are bred to run. Exactly. So 
I mean, once, and I always have to go back to you with the Florida State because that's where your bread and butter is with your team. You know how important speed is in athletics. And it just seems as if the difference between Florida speed and everywhere else, how big of a difference is it? Florida speed is on another level. Florida may not bring out the, Florida may not produce the biggest players, but they definitely produce the fastest players. If you have any questions about Florida speed, that's all. Definitely. And, and, and even with, with, with the other sports like track and field, when it comes time to go into these other, these, these national meets, I guarantee if it's not a, a team from Florida that's dominating, the athletes are probably from Florida. So, piece of advice to all the schools up north, if you want the, 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 the creme de la creme, the, the jackrabbits, the speed merchants, you got to come down to the Sunshine State. And, and you know, this is one thing I realized following basketball and football. While they, a guy that's rated 20th in Florida may be, re, may be more highly regarded than that top five player in Ohio, in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Iowa. So don't be shy. Don't be discouraged by that guy being rated 25th if he if you see him going to your program because I guarantee you will be happy about it later on um, looks like we're up against another break we'll be back in a few but we still before we close the show we have some more upcoming up updates for future sports in the Tampa Bay area so we'll see you in a few welcome back sports fans once again, I'm your host, Quinn Lowe, and this is my co-host, Nick Austin Holiday. And it's time to get into the local sports preview, sponsored by Child Scott Keepsakes. Up first is the USF Baseball. Overall, they're 18-4 and 5-3 and in the American Athletic Conference. They take on Stetson University on April 15th at the USF Baseball Stadium at 7 p.m. The USF women's softball team, overall 29-11, 3-3 in the American Athletic Conference, has a three-game series against U against UCF on April 12th and April 13th, 1 p.m., 3 p 3 p.m., and 1 p.m. on Sunday. Also, go Nick, what else is on the docket for this week? All right, the University of Tampa has some exciting sports coming up. Uh, on April 12th, the University of Tampa track team has a UT invite at 6 p.m. in Tampa, Florida. Uh, the University of Tampa baseball team, which is currently number one, currently the number one ranked baseball team in Division Two, uh, standing at 35 and two, 11 and one in the conference, has a has a three game series coming up against Nova Southeastern. Uh, those dates are April 18th at 6 p.m., April 19th at 1 p.m., and and again April well they have a doubleheader again April 19th at 4 p.m. Uh, the University of Tampa softball team, who's currently, which currently stands at 27 and 4, 15 and 3 in the in the conference, has a three-game series coming up against Lynn University. Those dates are April 17th at 6 p.m. and a doubleheader on April 18th at 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Also, before we close, we also have to give some, some love to the HCC baseball team, who is currently 22 and 16, 11 and 10 in the conference. They have a game on April 11th against Pasco Hernando State College at 3 p.m. And on Monday, they take on State College of Florida at 3 p.m. Well, it looks like we got to the end of another show. I know it's always hard to stop talking about sports because there's so much that we can go into, we can get into. But I want to thank you for standing in for my regular co-host, Antoine Jackson. Did a great job, and I know you fit right in because you made some, some Auburn and some Alabama fans upset with all the F, uh, Florida State talk. So, I mean, it's, this is a sports show where you can voice your opinion, keep it real, and I'm glad that you were able to fit in right with the, the Florida show. I, I'm glad to be here. You know, I plan on being here more in the future. There's a lot of sports to talk about. Football season. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Once with the, the, the influx of football season, we got a bunch of spring games coming up. Uh, UCF. And Orlando is having their spring game this weekend. I know in the Big Ten, I think they said it's 10 spring games this upcoming weekend. So if, you, if you're a football fan, even if you're a basketball fan, you're, you're having a hangover because of 
the, the NCAA championships, trust me, football is, is right around the corner. You got the draft in a couple of months. You get to see some of the local guys, some of the, the local collegiate stars, see where they end up, see where Kelvin Benjamin of Florida State ends up, see where Johnny Manziel goes, touchdown Johnny, see where some of these guys end up playing their professional careers at. And, and I'm just looking forward to this season. We, and we definitely here at uh, Between Class of Sports, we try to catch every single one of these sporting events so you guys can stay informed, so we can keep you guys up on up and up and up with everything that's going on. Well, to close the show, my name is Quinn Love, and once again, this is Nick Austin Holiday, and we'll see you next week. You know how we do when we have funky music in our ear. We get to right to ain't no fighting, we just sit there try to win. Ooh, yeah, la di da, we grinding hard. Ooh, yeah, we not gonna stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Too late to turn back now. I got work to do. On a mission, by my business, I'm pushing through, I'm pushing through, no slacking. Make it happen, we grinding, we grinding hard, we grinding hard. You know how we do when we have funky music in our ear. We get to right to ain't no fighting, we just sit there try to win. Ooh yeah, la di da, we grinding hard. Ooh yeah, we not gonna stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Too late to turn back now. I got work to do. On a mission, by my business, I'm pushing through, I'm pushing through, no slacking. Make it happen, we grinding, we grinding hard, we grinding hard. You know how we do when we have funky music in our ear. We get to right to ain't no fighting, we just sit there trying to win. Ooh yeah, la di da, we grinding hard. Ooh yeah, we not gonna stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Too late to turn back now. I got work to do. On a mission, by my business, I'm pushing through, I'm pushing through.